Good morning. morning. Isn't it a beautiful day to be in worship? That that crisp, cold air just awakens our senses to the beauty of God's world, doesn't it? Thank you for smiling. Yes. I'm so uh, thankful to be in worship with you all this morning. Um, As most of you know, my name is Pastor Esther Rosario, and I'm your pastor now. And for all of you who are worshiping online, thankful to be worshiping with you as well. Um, It's it's really a neat thing that our family has expanded from being those who are present in this place to include people who are able to, who are only able to worship with us online. So we give thanks to God for that. So as you all know, um, we are walking with our children and our youth in memorizing scripture, one verse per month. And so we're going to review the February verse that starts with this. Ready? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 118, 24. And this month's verse is on the screen. Ready? And But please memorize it because there will come a day when it won't be on the screen. Okay, next week. Okay, next week, heard that? Let all that you do be done in love. First Corinthians 16, 14. Okay, I'd like to share one thing with you before I forget. At the end of worship today, I will be exiting and I will be going straight home because we have two of our sons here who are leaving today to go back to Bloomington. And I have to be at True North at one o'clock. So I, I would like to go home and just have a quick lunch with them before they, before they leave. So I, I just wanted to let you all know that. I'm not trying to ignore you, um, but I just wanted to make you aware. Okay, thank you. Let us prepare our hearts for worship.
Good morning. Would you stand for the call to worship if you're able? And please join me. People of God, open your eyes. Look around. The presence of our Lord Jesus Christ is here. Among us and within us. God's salvation is close at hand. Nearer than you know. So open your hearts and minds to the Spirit. And let's worship God together. And join in singing hymn number 206. Please. Our scripture lesson today comes from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 to 14 from the Common English Bible. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So live your life as children of light. Light produces fruit that consists of every sort of goodness, justice, and truth. Therefore, test everything to see what's pleasing to the Lord and don't participate in the unfruitful actions of darkness. Instead, you should reveal the truth about them. It's embarrassing to even talk about what certain persons do in secret, but everything exposed to the light is revealed by the light. Everything that is revealed by the light is light. Therefore, it says, wake up, sleeper, get up from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
I'd like to invite Tara and her mom and her aunt to come up. I've asked for some for some help with the children's message today. No one will be harmed in this message. Okay? All right. So, will you please tie this on Nicole's eyes? Like, so she's blind. Okay, you step forward just a little bit. Okay, I want you to take a good look around before you get blindfolded, all right? Okay. All right. So, blindfold you. And keep your eyes closed, too, because these are sheer black scarves. So, I'm not sure how blind you'll really be if you just rely on them. <clears throat> so Tara, I'm going to ask you a question. If I told you that you're going to take a walk around the sanctuary and have to go down some steps and go in between pews, mm, okay, don't be anxious. I'm not, I'm not going to have you have you really do that. But would you want to be led by your aunt, who is also blindfolded, or by your mom, who can see? Your mom. That's right. Because we want to be able to trust the one who sees, right? Okay, you can take the blindfold off now. All right. So, thank you for... Yeah, look at that. And you can you can go sit down. I'm going to talk to Tara here for a minute. Tara, let's sit on the steps. Okay. So, so um, we did that just as a little example because in just a moment, I'm going to read a uh, Bible story from the Gospel of John about a man who had been blind. He couldn't see anything from the time he was born. He had no idea what the world looked like. And one day, Jesus and his disciples were walking past, and the disciples, you know, they saw this blind man begging, and they immediately, instead of saying, oh, how can we help him, they said, who sinned, this man or his parents? Made him blind. I mean, that, that's kind of rude, isn't it? Yeah. And, and Jesus said, neither him nor his parents, neither sinned. However, we have an opportunity here to display God's greatness in the glory of God. And so Jesus spit in the mud. I know, right? It's kind of gross. And then he stirred it up with his fingers. And then he put this mud made from his spit and dirt on the man's eyes. And then told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And when he did that, he could see. Isn't that awesome? All right. And then, and then he began giving glory to Jesus because he could see again and he had been blind. And so, I mean, obviously we can see, right? Physically we can see. But the thing is, when we follow Jesus, the way, if, if we aren't following the way Jesus asks us to, for example, if you're at school, and you see someone on the playground or at lunch and they're sitting by themselves and people are, oh, don't talk to that person. If, if you don't go and talk to them and, and just try to make friends with them, then you're blind. Blind to the love that Jesus wants you to share. But if you go talk to someone that nobody else wants to talk to, then you're sharing the love of Jesus with that person. Okay? So we want to follow Jesus who helps us to truly see with with his eyes and to love people the way he wants us to love, right? Okay, so we're going to say a prayer, and everybody's going to say the prayer with us. Um, and you can repeat after me. Um, and maybe next time we'll just speak it all the way through without repeating, okay? Okay, so good morning, God. This is your day. I am your child. Show me your way. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tara. Thank you for being so brave and coming up here in front of all these people. Will, will you please rise as you are able for the reading of the gospel lesson? Please hear these words. As Jesus walked along, 
he saw a man who was blind from birth. Jesus' disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned so that he was born blind, this man or his parents? Jesus answered, neither he nor his parents. <clears throat> this happened so that God's mighty works might be displayed in him. While it's daytime, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said this, he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and smeared the mud on the man's eyes. Jesus said to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went away and washed. When he returned, he could see. The man's neighbors and those who used to see him when he was a beggar said, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is. And others said, no, it's someone who looks like him. But the man said, yes, it's me. So they asked him, how are you now able to see? He answered, the man they called Jesus made mud, smeared it on my eyes and said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. They asked, where is this man? He replied, I don't know. Then they led the man who had been born blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus made the mud and smeared it on the man's eyes on a Sabbath day. So Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see. And the man told them, he put mud on my eyes. I washed and now I see. Some Pharisees said, this man isn't from God because he breaks the Sabbath law. Others said, how can a sinner do miraculous signs like these? So they were divided. Some of the Pharisees questioned the man who had been born blind again. What do you have to say about him since he healed your eyes? He replied, he's a prophet. The Jewish leaders didn't believe the man had been blind and received his sight until they called for his parents. The Jewish leaders asked them, is this your son? Are you saying he was born blind? How can he now see? His parents answered, we know he is our son. We know he was born blind, but we don't know how he now sees. And we don't know who healed his eyes. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jewish authorities. This is because the Jewish authorities had already decided that whoever confessed Jesus to be the Christ would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why his parents said, he's old enough. Ask him. Therefore, they called a second time for the man who had been born blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. The man answered, I don't know whether he's a sinner. Here's what I do know. I was blind and now I see. They questioned him, what did he do to you? How did he heal your eyes? He replied, I already told you and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They insulted him. You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we don't know where this man is from. The man answered, this is incredible. You don't know where he is from, yet he healed my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. God listens to anyone who is devout and does God's will. No one has ever heard of a healing of the eyes of someone born blind. If this man wasn't from God, he couldn't do this. They responded, you were born completely in sin. How is it that you dare to teach us? Then they expelled him. Jesus heard they had expelled the man born blind. Finding him, Jesus said, do you believe in the human one? 
He answered, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. Jesus said, You have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped Jesus. Jesus said, I have come into the world to exercise judgment so that those who don't see can see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard what he said and asked, Surely we aren't blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you wouldn't have any sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to be thick in this place. We invite your Holy Spirit to open our ears that we might hear what you have to say to us. We invite your Holy Spirit to open our eyes that we might see in the way you would have us see. We invite your Holy Spirit to open our hearts that we might love the way you would have us love. We invite your Holy Spirit to teach us this day. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For the first few moments of today's message, I'm inviting all of us to um, put ourselves into this story through a guided meditation. So I'm inviting everyone to close their eyes. I know this is risky, right? But I will just say this. If you happen to fall asleep during this meditation, it's okay. Because Falling asleep while meditating on God's word is the best way to rest. So it's okay. So I invite you to close your eyes and listen. Imagine with me that you are blind. Not just blind in this moment, but blind since birth. You've never seen your mama's face, the blue sky, a sunrise, a rainbow, spring flowers, swirling snow, budding trees, the beautiful colors of the fall leaves, your own face, your visual world is completely dark. You have known nothing else, nothing but darkness. And you're sitting on the side of the road, begging, for that's the only job you can do. People are walking by, and you hear some men ask, Rabbi, who sinned so that he was born blind, this man or his parents? Or Rabbi, who sinned so that she was born blind, this woman or her parents. And you are mortified. These men don't know you. They are making assumptions about your character 
based on blindness that you couldn't prevent, blindness over which you have no control. Being forced to beg for your living is bad enough, but to add the humiliation of people talking about you as if you can't hear what they're saying, as if you're an object to be debated, as if you or your parents caused this, how utterly humiliating. Then this rabbi, Jesus, speaks, neither he or she nor his parents or her parents. This happened so that God's mighty works might be displayed. While it's daytime, we must do the works of him who sent me. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Then Jesus spits on the ground and makes mud, smears it on your eyes, and says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. You listen, and you rise with mud-caked eyes and make your way to the pool of Siloam. You wash your eyes, and you are healed from your blindness. You can see. You may open your eyes. Look around. No, seriously, look around. I, I want you to look around. Imagine that you're seeing these faces for the first time. Did you look around? Did you look? Really look. You're seeing these faces. You're seeing this beautiful space for the first time. What a glorious moment that must have been for the man who was healed. What joy must have filled his soul. Imagine the wonder of seeing the world for the first time. I, I remember so vividly when our oldest son Christopher was a baby. He was born on April 30th. And towards the end of the summer, when we would take him outside, now of course he, he wasn't blind visually, he could see, but he was experiencing the world for the first time. And when we put his little hand on the bark of a tree, it was rough. When we put him down on the grass and held him so he could sit, and he, his little hands would reach out to touch the grass, and he'd pull them back because it was kind of prickly on his hands. He was in awe, just wonder of all these new things that he was discovering. Imagine trying to take all of this in, savoring the beauty of being able to see. It must have been overwhelming in an amazing way. But this man who had suffered his entire life and had just experienced a miracle couldn't catch a break from people's hurtful comments. The man's neighbors and the people who had passed by him as he begged on the street argued about his healing. Is this really the man who used to sit and beg? And some, say, some would say, oh, yes, yes, that's him. But others said, no, he just looks like him. <laughs> Why couldn't they just celebrate with him? Why did there have to be so much drama, unnecessary drama? And they finally asked him how he's able to see. And he, he told them about Jesus. The people wanted to know where Jesus was, but the man didn't know. So they took him to the Pharisees. Well, the day that Jesus healed the blind man was on the... Yep, Jesus was in trouble again for healing on the Sabbath. The Pharisees questioned the man about how he was able to see, and the man explained that Jesus put mud on his eyes, and he washed, and then he could see. Did the Pharisees celebrate with him? No, of course not. They were more concerned that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. He spit in the dirt to make mud, he stirred it, and then he put the mud on the man's eyes. That was work. He had broken the Sabbath law. 
Some of the Pharisees couldn't think of anything else. But interestingly, some of the Pharisees reasoned that a sinner, like one who, who breaks a Sabbath law, couldn't do miraculous signs like these, so they were divided. And then some questioned the man about Jesus. What do you have to say about him since he healed your eyes? And the man replied, he's a prophet. They weren't convinced. The Jewish leaders didn't believe the man had been blind, so they consulted with his parents. And the parents were shaken in their boots when they were called. They were afraid because the religious leaders had made it known that if anyone claimed that Jesus was the Messiah, was the Christ, that they would be banished from the synagogue. And they didn't want to be cast out. So they gave a simple answer, stating simply what they knew. We know he is our son. We know he was born blind, but we don't know how he now sees, and we don't know who healed his eyes. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. They were too fearful to celebrate that their son, who had been blind from birth, was now healed of his blindness. The Jewish leaders talked to the healed man a second time, commanding him to give glory to God and not to Jesus, saying, we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. They refused to see the glory of God in Jesus. The man answered, I don't know whether he's a sinner. Here's what I do know. I was blind and now I see. Oh, that reminds me of a hymn. So let's sing the first stanza. We probably all know the first stanza of Amazing Grace. There won't be any words on the screen. Okay. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves. blind and now I see there is so much power in these life-giving words the blind man had no education he had no religious authority but he had been touched and healed by the Savior and his life was forever changed the Jewish leaders wanted to know again how Jesus had healed him, and the man replied, I already told you, and you didn't listen, and, and you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Yeah, we laugh, right? So was he being sincere with that question, or was he just pushing some buttons? Hmm, pretty bold. Then the religious leaders turned on him, and they proudly proclaimed, they boasted, that they were disciples of Moses. And they stated that they didn't know where Jesus was from. They basically announced their own spiritual blindness, their pride of education, status, religious knowledge, and faithfully following the letter of the law blinded them to the compassion, mercy, and love of God. It blinded them to seeing the Imago Dei, the image of God in everyday people. It blinded them to seeing Jesus for who he truly was. They had their own religious club and there was no room for anyone else, not even the Son of God. They alone held the truth of God. Isn't that a terrifying thought? The blind beggar was a nothing in that culture and nobody. Jesus had not only healed him physically, he had healed him spiritually. This man who had been blind since birth, who as I said earlier was not educated, but now he could see that the religious leaders were blind, 
blind to seeing that Jesus' healing power was from God, and he boldly told them that. If this man wasn't from God, he couldn't do this. And that was it. The religious leaders had had enough. They verbally put him down. You were born completely in sin. The message translation says, you are dirt. How is it that you dare to teach us? Then they kicked him out. And when Jesus heard that the religious leaders had kicked out the man born blind, he went to find him and asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man born blind responded with honesty, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. Now think about it. This man had never seen, actually seen Jesus because when he was sitting by the side of the road and was blind, Jesus put mud on his eyes and said, Go wash. And he went. But when he returned and was able to see, Jesus was no longer there. So this was the first time he was seeing Jesus face to face. Jesus said, you have seen him. In fact, <laughs> he's the one speaking with you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped Jesus. And this story wraps up with Jesus teaching the Pharisees that he's come into the world to exercise judgment so that those who don't see can see, and those who see will become blind. The Pharisees asked, surely we aren't blind, are we? And Jesus responded, if you were blind, you wouldn't have any sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Ouch. <laughs> so we've walked through the whole story together and what lessons are we to learn from this story? I'd like to lift up just a few. <clears throat> First, we learn from Jesus' interaction with the disciples. You know, the disciples spent every day with Jesus, learning from him, living with him. They were learning how to love God, how to love their neighbor, how to love each other, so that when Jesus was gone, they would be able to carry out Jesus' mission of sharing the good news that God loves, God loves you. God loves you. Yet when they saw this blind beggar, their first thoughts were of blame and sin. They didn't see the man. They only saw that his sin or his parents' sin had made him this way. They totally missed the opportunity for extending compassion and mercy to one who so desperately needed it. In Jesus' eyes, this blind beggar was a somebody. Jesus truly saw him, saw him as a beloved child of God who is worthy of being seen, who is worthy of being acknowledged as a person of value, who is totally worth his time. Jesus not only healed this man, he also sought him out when he learned that the man had been kicked out by the religious leaders. And in doing so, he gave this nobody the most priceless gift of knowing him as the Messiah, as the Savior. So please turn to your neighbor. Okay? And if you're sitting alone, I invite you to find someone because you're going to repeat after me. Okay? It's important that you can look into someone's eyes and speak these words. Okay? So I'll give you a moment to get adjusted. Okay. So please repeat after me, looking into your neighbor's eyes. I see you. You are worthy of being loved. You are totally worth my time. Jesus loves you. That's pretty easy to do when we're in this place, right? When with our family, our friends, our community of faith, in this beautiful worship space. But what about when we're outside these four walls? 
What about when we are confronted with someone who's dirty, whose clothes are ragged, who might be homeless, an addict, someone who's emotionally disturbed, someone who's not like us? What then? Are we able to look into their eyes and say, I see you. You are worthy of being loved. You are totally worth my time. Jesus loves you. When we can do that, that, my friends, is being able to see. We can also learn from Jesus' response to the disciples' question about who sinned, and he answers it two ways. First, Jesus immediately shut down the blame game, neither he nor his parents. See, when we're on the outside looking in, placing blame does no one any good. It's just an excuse to do nothing about the situation. It's a wrong focus. It's a distraction. And when it becomes a topic of conversation without action to back up those words, it's gossip. That's all it is, gossip. So he shut down the blame game. And then Jesus challenged the disciples to seize opportunities to partner with God to work for good in the world. We must do the works of him who sent me. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus taught his disciples, Let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We are called to live in a way that shines the light of Christ in hopeless, dark situations to glorify our Father in heaven. And when we're able to keep our focus on being the light of Christ and all that that entails, we are able to see. We learn from the Pharisees' reaction to the healing of the man born blind. And maybe this is way too simplistically stated, but here goes. Their pride of being knowledgeable about the law of God made them too big for their bridges. Their hearts were hardened. They were unteachable, unmoldable. They wouldn't listen. They were know-it-alls. They thought they were the final authority. And they didn't want anyone upsetting that, not even the Son of God. Physically, they could see, but spiritually, they were blind, and arrogantly so. And we learn from the blind man's parents. They stated the basic truth, but would not stand with their newly healed son because they were afraid. Fear made them hide. Fear held them in bondage. It's all they could see was their fear. The disciples, the Pharisees, the man's parents, they all, they all looked at the man born blind, but none of them saw him. And the only difference between the man born blind and all the others in today's gospel lesson, except for Jesus, of course, is that the man born blind knows that he is blind. Until we know we are blind, we can never see with new eyes. Surely we are not blind, are we? Blindness is not about the quality of our vision or the condition of our physical eyes. It is not about the darkness around us, but rather the darkness within us. How we see others and what we see in the world, the way we see life is less about what we see and more about ourselves. We do not see God people, things, or circumstances as they are, but as we are. Until our eyes are opened by Christ, 
our seeing is really just a projection of ourselves onto the world. And what we see and how we see reveals what is in our hearts. Jesus healed the man born blind. Jesus met a need in the man's life that transformed him physically and spiritually. This man who had been absolutely nothing and nobody in the world's eyes had the courage again and again to say what he knows, to speak truth to power, to speak truth to the religious authorities who had the power to kick him out, and they did. He had the courage to tell what he could about the amazing grace by which he had been touched. Sisters and brothers in Christ, the invitation for us today is to be willing to humble ourselves before our Savior, to confess that we don't have all the answers, to confess that we are not perfect, and that too often our pride and fear blind us to the opportunities that God sets before us. May we be able to pray with longing hearts, open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. For the glory of God and for the sake of the world, may this be so. And all God's children say, Amen. to go before the throne of grace. Um, I have a joy to share with you. Um, the flowers, um, the beautiful flowers, are given in celebration of Norbert and Adrian Milzarek's 63rd wedding anniversary, which is today. Congratulations. Yeah. We celebrate with you. Yes. 
And please um, add to your prayer list um, Dorothy Cross and her family on the unexpected loss of, of her niece, Valerie. Um, so today, um, we are once again uh, praying the prayers of the people. So I will lift up a petition, which will be up on the screen. And then I will be silent and allow you to, to call out names or pray out loud. Um, and then, um, then I'll close that time, that petition with Lord in your mercy. And you'll say, hear our prayer. Let us go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Gracious God, we love you and we are so thankful that you call us to yourself, that you call us together to worship you and to encourage each other. O oh Lord, hear us now as together we pray for the people of our congregation. We celebrate the love that you have given to Norbert and Adrian. Lord, in your mercy. Together, let us pray for those who suffer and those in trouble. Dorothy and her family as they grieve for Valerie. Lord, in your mercy. Together, let us pray for the concerns of our local community.
Lord, in your mercy, together let us pray for the world, its peoples, and its leaders. Lord, in your mercy. Together, let us pray for the church universal, its leaders, its members, and its mission. Bishop Trimble, and the Reverend Dr. Marty Lundy, and the Reverend Paul Arnold. Yes. Lord, in your mercy, we thank you, O oh God, that you hear the prayers that we've spoken out loud and the prayers that we hold so quietly in our hearts. And we thank you, loving Heavenly Father, that you were willing to become one of us In Jesus to show us how much you love us to show us that you are always with us and we thank you God for Jesus great sacrifice of love that he was willing to pour out his life for the sake of love and we thank you God that he rose in victory over sin and death, that we might share in his victory, and that we might be invited into your family as beloved children of God. So God, we ask now that you hear us as we, your beloved children, pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. My friends, I can hardly believe this, but two weeks from today is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. And we will have the blessing of um, having the choir lead us through the entire worship service by the singing of a cantata. So please, please be here. And, and of course, that week is Holy Week, and we have several worship services that week. Mark your calendars. On Thursday, Maundy Thursday, we will have worship in this space at noon and at 7. And then on Good Friday, um, we will have worship in this space at noon and in Carl Parish Hall at 7 p.m. Both will be uh, a service of tenebrae, a service of darkness. So I invite you to, to come to that. And then, of course, the big celebration on Easter Sunday. So invite your friends and family to our worship services um, that we might experience all of this together. Um, also, we have the opportunity to purchase Easter flowers for, um, for Easter Sunday. Um, for either in this space or in the Carl Parish Hall. Um, and that information is on the website, or you can call Joanne in the church office to talk to her about that. And we also have, you, this is, uh, it, it's not an either or, it could be a both and. So in addition to purchasing Easter flowers, uh, or instead of purchasing Easter flowers, either way, you can also donate um, Camperships, so donate an amount so that we can help our children and youth go to camp or go on a mission trip. So, um, just to let you know about that, and um, also as we continue our time of worship, this is a time where we reflect on giving and being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Um, just takes all of who we are, not just. Um, one hour a week or two hours a week if we go to Bible study, but every single day, every hour of every day, we are disciples of Jesus. And growing disciples of Jesus um, include giving as part of their discipleship. And we ask that you just give as the Lord asks you to give, because it's in this place where we pool our resources that we were able to equip and train disciples who go into the world to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, all for the glory of God. So um, thank you for giving generously as the Lord asks you to give.
Almighty God, all that we have comes from you. Please accept our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings and multiply them for your use that your kingdom might be brought into our homes, our churches, our workplaces, our schools, our neighborhoods, our nation, and our world, all for the glory of your Son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Friends, as we leave this place of worship where we have been encouraged and we've given encouragement, we've heard the word of God, may we go out into this world and truly see people who are hurting, who are lonely, who are desperate, hopeless, and may we be able to say to them, this is what I know. I was blind and now I see. You are loved and you are worthy of my time. And may the blessing of God Almighty, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and remain with us forever. And all God's children say, Amen. Thank you.